Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. Today, that's what we're going to talk about. It's the parable of the banquets. This is found in Luke chapter 14. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to move on that way. Luke chapter 14. I've been telling you for this for weeks, but I've, I've, I've put, summed it up again, and I just want to remind you again that when Luke was writing, there's four things that he wanted you to understand in his writing. Jesus is the perfect man. That's the first thing he wanted you to know. The Greeks were looking for a perfect universal human. Jesus is that perfect man, and he came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. The reason he came to this earth was to seek and save the lost. The saddest part is that the most lost people were those who were the Pharisees, and they didn't think they were lost. Therefore, they were never found. Heartbreaking, they were never found. Jesus came to seek and save the lost among all people. Today, we're going to talk about all kinds of people. How many of y'all know some all kinds of people? How many of y'all's family is filled with some all kinds of people? How many of y'all wake up some days and you don't know what kinds of people you're going to be? Ain't you glad that that mercy is new every morning? Because there are some days I'm a half-decent person. And then all the other days, the other seven days a week, I need grace. I'm thankful that he he takes all kinds of people. And the purpose of taking all kinds of people was to fill them with himself. Those are the four things. Jesus came to be a perfect man, to seek and save the lost among all the people of the earth, and to fill them with himself. The Holy Spirit is to be filling each one of us. Jesus, if you ever get confused in life, Jesus is both the model of how you should act, but he's also the object of your affection. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you had to ask yourself, like, WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? And so somebody is great in your nerves, they're at, they're at your job, and they're constantly annoying the mess out of you and you go to your office and you put your hand on your head and you say okay all right what would Jesus do how would Jesus handle this person okay see that helps that's helpful like he would love them he would reach out to them he would try to save them but he'd also be flipping them tables you know what I'm saying like there comes a time where you finally say I'm not taking it anymore okay so when you get to that point don't act on it let me give you a second thing to think about okay so that's your model Jesus is your model do all right here's the second question if that person was Jesus the object of your affection if that person was Jesus how would you treat them even if you felt mistreated by them do you know some people felt mistreated by Jesus some people felt mistreated by Jesus. We think of Jesus as this like butterfly fairy that walks in and he's just happy to everybody, some people, you know. You get a blessing and you get a blessing and you get a blessing. Like Jesus from time to time, he graded folks' nerves. He was a prophet, just like every other prophet. People wanted to pick up stones and throw at this guy. So just because you're annoyed by this other person, I know you've got your case and how they're the one who's wrong and they're the, always the one that's backwards. Take a second, breathe, and just say, if this irritating somebody was Jesus, how would I treat them? Now, you're going to have a lot better behavior if you'll take the time to ask that question on everything in your life. You don't have time to do that. But if you were to do that, Remind yourself, he models the mission. He's the one who models the mission for us. What would Jesus do is a great question to ask yourself. Anytime you have issues, what would Jesus do? And then when you get really frustrated, think, if this was Jesus, how would I want to treat them? You know, Jesus like served dinner and washed the feet of the dude who went and betrayed him and had him killed. Like he knew that was happening. He told the dude he was going to do it. And he still washed them feet. Can you serve others even when they're not worthy of your serving, your service? Jesus is the greatest man who ever lived. If you want to be aspiring to be like somebody, be like Jesus. What a great example. We have a lot of people in this world, they want to figure out how to run businesses like Jeff Bezos or, or be as in, uh, genius, be a genius like Elon Musk or to play sports like the people who play sports these days, okay, you get it. But the people to follow, the, the only one worthy of being followed is Jesus Christ who changed the entire world by loving people. Jesus didn't innovate a new, 
uh, instrument of some sort. He didn't create computers. He didn't make the car. Jesus came to this earth and said, love one another. And it was revolutionary enough that everybody on this earth hears the name Jesus before anybody else. Like he's the most famous person on the galaxy for saying, love one another. Jesus is our model. We should say WWJD. Jesus taught us how to live the right way. His mission was all people. We love one another how we should love Jesus. If Jesus was the person, how would we treat them? I just said that. But here's the last thing. What kinds of people did Jesus come for? Now that's an important question to ask before we go to the scripture because it's even in us sometimes that we only want to go to the people that are like us. We only want to make ourselves available to the people who are like us. In fact, that's the basis of a friendship. The basis of a friendship is we look at another person and we go, oh, me too. There's something about that feeling. When you sit down at the table, you don't know anybody, and they're wearing a red skin hat, praise God, and you just know, I've got something in common with this joker. There's something about, you know, even if they sit down with a Dallas Cowboy hat, that's exciting. You know why? Because we have in common that we like football. Even if they like Satan and I love Jesus, (laughs) at least we love football together. There's something about that commonness that makes us feel like we're friends with people. We love the common feeling, but what do we do for the people we have nothing in common with? What, what are you doing today for those you have nothing in common with? That's a huge test on if you'll follow Jesus because Jesus took care of all kinds of people. He ministered to all kinds, all types, socioeconomic, different races. He was regularly ministering to all people. Here we go, verse 7. Ver, uh, chapter 14, verse 7. Now Jesus told a parable for those who were invited When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you might be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come to say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now let me just be very quick. This is not a gimmick. This is not a trick of some sort. Jesus is not trying to tell you how to get a promotion. Okay? Let me just tell you, it's very annoying to me when there are seats, and this is not in this context, those, those bleachers are the seats, okay? So please understand what I'm getting ready to say. I get really annoyed when there are seats prepared and people want to sit away from the seats that were prepared for people to sit in. That is not a blessing. That is not a situation where I'm like, oh, honored guest, why don't you, what if I were to do that? What if I were to start saying to everybody on the back, you know, in the bleachers, I was like, honored guest, these front rows are for you. Move forward. I'm waiting on you. Come to the front. Like, none of you would move, okay? It's not, it's not a gimmick. Jesus isn't saying this is how things ought to work, okay? What he's talking about is have the attitude that when you walk in the room that you're the, not the most important person in the room. So what... You know, I'm, he's not giving us some type of gimmick to get people to, here's what's really frustrating about this, is sometimes people are so false, hu- humble, there's false humility in their life, so what they end up doing is they'll come to you and say something like, hey, how did you, how's school going? Well, it's not going good, I'm not doing good on my math or whatever. Oh yeah, why not? Because I'm dumb. Anybody ever heard a kid say that? Now what do they want, that, what is that kid wanting, wanting from you? No, you're not. I can't stand it. I hate playing games that other people get to choose the rules. So I have a hard time saying, no, you're not. You're not dumb. I've been working around schools for many years now. I've heard kids come up and they'll be like, you know what? It's just so sad. I'm the only person in my whole class that don't have a, girl, or don't have a girlfriend or don't have a boyfriend or whatever. Well, why do you think that is? Because I'm ugly. <sighs> 
No, you're not. You're pretty. You're, you're, you're a handsome guy. That's not, that's not why. Oh, man, it just, it, I hate that expectation. I hate that expectation. I, when, when somebody throws it out in front of you to see if you'll counteract, that's, that's not a game I'm good at. I don't take hints. Listen to me. If you're on Facebook today and you're waiting at home until I come see you in your house and you're testing me right now, I failed. Just come back. I failed. You can feel like I don't love you or whatever it is, but I failed. Just come on back, okay? There are people here that will love the mess out of you. I'm an idiot, okay? All right. If you are waiting, are you dropping hints? Somebody say amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> if, I, if, you're, if you're waiting for me to pick up on the hint, I failed. I'm just not going to play the game. I don't like playing people's games when they don't expressly tell me what the rules are and if I don't agree to the rules. I don't like those games. All right? I'm not a gimmick guy. And Jesus isn't saying here, sit a long way off so that people will notice you being crazy out yonder and they'll invite you in. Because what happens is if you don't get invited in, you're just out there and you don't get anything to eat. And then you're like, nobody invited me in. Just come to the table. What he's saying is, when you go into a room, don't assume you're the most important person in the room. In fact, don't run to the place that would make you the most important. Some of us take this too far. I remember when I was in, in youth group, every time I'd go to any type of function, I would walk in the room and then stand up against the wall and wait for everybody else to take a seat because I was horrified that I might be sitting down when somebody else came in and needed a seat. So I would stand up like a crazy person over to the wall and wait you know, 20 minutes into service to make sure that everybody else had a seat. And it's like, Webb, what are you doing? Oh, I just don't want to be in the way of anybody. Okay, get up if somebody walks in. Notice people. Anyway, that we can take it too far. We can take these games too far, and we'll say things like, well, I'm just trying to do what Jesus said. Jesus wasn't saying be a weirdo. He was saying put other people in front of yourself. If you are not the most important person in the room, don't run for the most important chair. I think that's why I like the front row, because nobody else does. It's just us, right? I like the front row. I like being up front. I'm the weirdo. It's not a gimmick to get what you want. Jesus isn't trying to give you a trick. He's like, if you take the bad table, you'll get the good seat. No. What he's saying is have the heart to care more about what other people need more than yourself. That last verse, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This was a life verse for me. It helped me so much. I'd go to district councils from time to time, and when I first got out of college and I started going to district councils, Charles Kelly would shake my hand with such for He was the district superintendent at the time. He would shake, and he'd be like, this is one of our, this is our up-and-coming guys right here, and I'm 22 years old, and my chest is all swelling, like, yep, yeah, one of the up-and-comers, here I go, you know. And I felt, so, oh, man, it, was, it felt so good. But you know what happened? I turned 23. And I wasn't the crop of southeastern students that came back to flood every job in North Carolina. So I got a, I got a couple less handshakes. And that's fine. A couple less. I'm good. At 24, everybody else is getting called the southeastern student. And I'm just another guy in North Carolina. And it wasn't long. I didn't even get hands shook or eyes my way. It didn't matter if I was in the room. And I would go to these district functions and I would just be like, well, if nobody even cares that I'm here, why am I even into ministry anymore? Do y'all have any idea how stupid that is? Charles Kelly did not call me to the ministry. Rick Ross did not call me, validate me, exalt me. And the Lord gave me this scripture. I think it was actually Pastor Buddy who told me this. He could tell I was moping. And he told me, he said, Webb, if you'll humble yourself before the Lord, he will exalt you when it's time. And I'm going to tell you right now, I feel like I'm on the highest mountain of my life. When the Lord called me, there was nothing higher than being the pastor of Askeville Assembly. I cannot believe the favor of God in my life that I get to stand in this place. What I can tell you is it won't Webb. What I can tell you is it won't Charles Kelly and it won't Rick Ross. Rick Ross would have had you a Texan in here. 
What I can tell you today is that the reason I stand in this place right now is because God exalted me when I was willing to put my head down and say, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do it. I'm not trying to talk about myself today. What what I'm trying to tell you is this is not a gimmick. Me and Pastor Buddy didn't go together and say, hey, Webb, why don't you go off for a few years so people forget how stupid you are, and then right when they're about done, we'll bring you back and see if you can't become the next pastor. This wasn't a gimmick. Pastor Buddy's plan was to still be here right now. This was God's plan. We both decided to humble. What 62-year-old man decides to humble himself enough to follow what the Lord is calling him to do when he's in the days where he needs to keep a job, not, not, not change a job? Pastor Buddy is a man who was under the call of God, and he followed when he said it's time to move. We are all better off when people do what God tells us to do. Jesus is pulling from Proverbs chapter 25, verses 6 to 7. Proverbs 25, 6 to 7 says, Do not put yourself forward to the king's pres- in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. That's exactly what's in Proverbs. That's what Jesus is talking about here. So here we go. Verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Now, he's not saying don't ever do that. Your pastor should be in that list too. He's not saying don't ever do that. What Jesus is saying is don't let that be the only people you bless is the people who are already you have relations with. How about you invite some folks that are not in your circle, that are not at your job, that are not in your family, that are not your friends, that are not rooting for the same team as you do this year when your team doesn't even make the playoffs why don't you plan to do a Super Bowl party so that those whose team is in the Super Bowl they don't have to do they don't have to host they can just sit come to your house and watch the game you keep the nachos rolling he said when you give a dinner or a banquet do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And if you want a good test of whether or not you're doing what Jesus would do, you need to ask yourself, what am I doing for those who are not like me? What are you doing for those who can't bless you back? Now, I'm going to tell you, if, if you ever get an invitation, and, and you won't, but if you ever get an invitation to my house, <laughs> we don't do a lot of cooking. We, we want to. We, we would love to have every one of you. But if I invite you to my house for steaks, I want to go to your house for steaks. <laughs> In fact, I might cook you some chicken thighs and hope you have ribeyes. A lot of us spend our days blessing those who can bless us back. We only want to take people to lunch who could take us to lunch later. We don't mind covering somebody's lunch because we'll go to lunch with this person again and they'll catch it next time. This week I'll take you to McDonald's. Next week you can take me to Old Colony. You know what I'm saying? We want, you know what it is? I wrote this down. This is a really cool thought. I mean, a really cool way to... It's mutual admiration society. That's what the fellowship of the church becomes, mutual admiration society. We walk around to each other. We go, oh, I love your hair. And what we want to hear in response is not thank you. That's not what we want to hear in response. We want to hear yours too. (laughs) Man, that's a nice ride. Look at what you're riding around in. What we want to hear back is yours isn't bad. Webb, I don't feel that way. I genuinely mean what I'm sure you think you do. But sometimes we get to the place where we only want to bless where we thought we would get reciprocated. Not all of us. Some of us are actually saved. (laughs) But most of the time, many, many times in our lives, we spend a lot of our time trying to just get reciprocation and relationship. And this is, you know... That, that's like false hospitality. 
I'll hold the door for you so you can hold the door for me. You ever done that? You ever go to like a, a, a Parker's is one of those places I think. There's a door to the outside and you're like, oh, here you go. Your whole family can go in front of me and get the family uh, deal while you're in there and you'll get the table and I'll have to wait for it. Go ahead. God bless you. All 13 of you. Awesome. Go ahead. And then you finally get done with that whole crowd of people who all go in that little vestibule and then when you step in, they've held the door for you and you're like, oh, thank you. Go ahead. And then you walk past them. That's a great trick. If I know there's a second door, I'm getting the first one so that you'll hold it for me so I can get the table first. Genius. <laughs> Jesus sees this in us. A lot of times the reason we're kind to anybody is because we're hoping to invest in the relationship long enough that one day we can get a return. Some people even do that in ministry. They say, I want to go on a mission trip so that I can, in return, one day see all the great things. And they can tell me how great of a job I did. Now, I'm not saying anybody here has ever done that. I'm just saying that happens. There are times where you want to do ministry so you can say, hey, look at what I accomplished. Look what I invested in. Look where the seeds of, of all that I did. Look at this great thing. When what God is saying that if you really wanted to follow God and be faithful, then you would expect that reward to take place in heaven. You wouldn't need to see it here. Now, that doesn't mean we need to get weird about it either. If you bless somebody, you don't need to find three different people to hand the check to before it gets to the other person and be like, I don't know where it came from. Like, I'm not saying we have to get weird, but, you know, don't let the right hand with the, with the left hand. We don't have to go crazy with it. But the, the point is, is your heart to actually bless people, even when they're not like you and they can't reciprocate, is your heart to bless people and just have them be blessed? You know, a lot of times we spend a lot of our days trying to be like, you know what, I know why I had to go through this because after this took place and then that took place and then this took place, now I know I had to go through this because of this. The only problem with that mentality, and there isn't a lot, but there is a one problem. The problem is sometimes the payoff is not worth the trial. Sometimes people will look at people who just lost loved ones and they'll be like, you know what, you're going through this so that you can help others when they go through it too. I'm just going to tell you, for some people, that payoff is not enough. I do not want to lose this person so that I can help other persons. Give me a seminar. I don't want to have to endure a drug addiction so that I can help other people with drug addiction. Now, who are the best people to help drug addicts? Former drug addicts, yes, but I, Lord, don't, I, that's not what, I don't want that. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't want to have to endure divorce so that I can care for people in divorce. If God were to tell me every reason I had to go through something was so that I could get to here, I'm pretty sure I would not think that link was worth it. So I need to live my life saying, God, I'm going to work as faithful as I can, and I'm going to trust that there's going to be a reward. And I don't need to know what it is. Let's go further. Verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. This dude did not read the room. Jesus is letting them have it. And it's like, bless God. <laughs> we all are going to eat bread in heaven. And at that time of the banquet, he sent his servant. I'm sorry. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet, invited many... And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. <sighs> excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Now let me just tell you, the cultural time of that day, an invitation would go out and you would RSVP and say, I'm coming. And what the idea was, then you would send a messenger out on the day and it would let you know when the pig was ready. You know what I'm saying? It was a pig picking. Okay, they didn't eat pig. But anyway, so what would happen was you had this big banquet. You'd say, I'm coming. And then when the time for it actually happened, then a messenger would go out and say, it's time to eat. Let's go. So what they had done, all these people that sit in their RSVPs, we are coming to eat. The time for the meal came. He sends out the messenger, and everyone they went to, they had excuses. Listen to this first one. Uh, the first one said to him, I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Okay. How many of you have ever bought land? Did you buy the piece of land before you looked at it? 
And if you had bought the piece of land before you looked at it, what's it going to hurt to wait till tomorrow? Like, there's roast cow. Why, why won't you... Why, why are you making this excuse now? You said you were coming and now you're not coming. The second one. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Five yoke of oxen. Okay, how many of y'all buy a car without looking at it? How many of you bought a tractor without looking at it? Okay, some of you may have. All right. If you, I've already said I'm coming to dinner, why have you chosen this to be the time you go check out the ox? Please have me excuse it. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Okay. Did you not plan? <laughs> now, I understand when the wife says no, that's, that's the end of it. I get it. How, how long had the invitation been sent? I don't know. I mean, I just, I just, some of the questions I have here, but it, what, a, what a weird way to say, hey, look, I got married and I can't come. Excuse me. Gentlemen, I know every one of you in this room have done that at some point. And in fact, when you get real married is when she lets you use her name when you don't want to go somewhere. That's really what it is. They, they wanted me to go out tonight. Do you mind if I tell them you said I couldn't go? <laughs> so the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done. Still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now, Christians, let's sober up for just a second. Let's hear this. God has invited you to be a part of his family to come to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. In fact, he's invited you to be the bride but what will distract you or delay you from coming to the feast? There are three major areas in our lives that we get distracted and delayed. Number one is in our possessions. Many of us manage our possessions so much we cannot pay attention to managing our soul to having the relationship with God that we need to do because we are constantly having to look over our land, over our machines, over our steads, over our homes, plural. And we say to ourselves, I don't have time for God because of the blessings he's given you. You don't have time for God. The second one is our business. Well, Webb, I'm just taking up a few shifts. I'm just taking a few shifts. That's all. I'll be back. I'll be back. We have to be careful. I'm not, hey, I'm not up here telling you that if you don't take Sundays off, you're going to hell. Okay, don't hear that. What I'm telling you is be careful. Tend your soul. Do not allow business, your job, don't allow work to get in the way of your devotion to God. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about daily devotions. If, if you say, Webb, I work too much every day to put in the time with the Lord, I'm telling you, you need to find a job, a different job. Because he's going to call. He's going to call. And if you're distracted or delayed by the things that matter less than him, you will not taste his banquet. I didn't say it. The one who's calling the banquet said it. Not my rule. The third area is I have a lot of people that will say things like this. Well, pastor, I can't come to church because Sunday is the only day I had to be with my family. It's the only day I had to be with my family. It's the only day I had to be for myself. 
And I'm just telling you, if you care more about yourself than you do the Lord, when he calls for the banquet, you will not taste his banquet. And you will be on the outside looking in, and a crippled person will have your place. Which is fine. (laughs) We're not angry about cripples. A handicapped person will have your seat. What? what, what, It's fine. A A broken person will have your seat. Now, what does that mean? Yes, Jesus came to save the lost. All of those people fit that bill. You know what? Handicapped people, they don't have to look at oxen. They're not buying oxes. What are the other distinctions? Let's see here. Crippled, blind, lame, poor. Poor people, they're not buying land. You say, that ain't true. I bought land. You ain't poor. (laughs) My literal point. Thank you. Glad we had this conversation. The crippled, the lame, the blind will sit in your seat if you're not ready when he calls. Because those people are not distracted by the things of this world. The blind, they don't get to get married. I know a blind man that got married. Okay, I'm not saying, what I'm saying is most of the time, a crippled person doesn't get to follow oxen, purchase oxen. Those people who are down and out, all they actually have is Jesus. The things that distract us from Jesus is the blessings that Jesus gives us and we have an issue in church world today because there is a huge group of people that are making a lot of money by telling the church that if you'll follow Jesus your health will come back your wealth will get greater your relationships will be fantastic everything in your life is happy and good and we call that the prosperity gospel and it's like this huge thing and I'm telling you what that's a money maker People who preach like this, they got their own uh, airplanes. <laughs> then you've got these angry, bitter old folks, and I don't want to put a label on these, but they're like, don't come to Jesus because of good things. You come to Jesus because he's God, and you better, if you ever get anything good in your life, you better throw it away. Have you ever met these Christians? You have a good day ever, like once in your life you have a good day and they're like mad about, oh, I don't, don't enjoy this good day. Tomorrow's going to be bad. They're the kind of Christians that when you pull up in your new vehicle and you're like, hey, what do you think? And their response is, do you have any idea how many people could be fed in Africa with this? <laughs> what a waste. A waste. You make me sick. same Christians that say things like, well, things are going a little too good for you. You know, that's coming down. When the other shoe falls, you know, the scripture says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to cry with, mourn with those who mourn. There's some Christians that love to do the opposite of that. If you're crying, they're sitting there doing the whole time telling jokes. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Tomorrow's going to be great. And the day you come in uh, laughing about something, they immediately want to tell you about how all the martyrs in China are being murdered. They got to Slap you, whatever way you're at, we're going to slap you right. Now, let me just tell you, I am not affirming prosperity, but I will tell you this. I don't know a single person who's ever turned their life over to Jesus that good things didn't happen to them. I don't know anybody whose health, wealth, life, relationships, the more they turn themselves over to God, that they don't have blessings in their life. What I am going to tell you is that if you're coming to God for blessings, you ain't going to find them. He has a way of keeping those things away. He only gives it to the children who actually want him. And I'll tell you this other person. This person probably is going to still make it to heaven. (laughs) Maybe. But if they truly believe that no good thing has come to them because of Christ, why are they following Christ? He's not some rock in the sky waiting to beat us down. He's a benevolent father that wants to love on us and help us and And if nothing else, the fact that he is with us is a blessing in itself. So therefore, I am getting benefit from being with God. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. I got something out of the deal. I also will tell you that spiritual gifts are not worthy of being chased after. 
I've told you the story a bunch of times, but I'm not going to stop telling it. I used to seek every single week in the, in, the, in the altar, God, please give me tongues. Lord, I want to speak in tongues. I want the gift of tongues. I want the gift of tongues. I begged. I white-knuckled. I cried. I did what everybody said. This person said, hang on. I hung on. This person said, let go. I let go. I did everything I was told in the altar. I listened to prayer after prayer after prayer, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it until I finally said to the Holy Spirit, I don't care if I ever get that gift. I just want you. And when I said that, a, a well opened up in me, and I began to speak. And I found out that day, I really could care less. If God took the gift away from me today and I never spoke again, it wouldn't change my relationship with him. All that would change is that I would want more of him. He is the prize. Now, that has to be genuine. You can't make that up. I mean, you can fake it till you make it, but you better make it. Because there's, th- there's three things that Jesus brings up here that we need to be watching out for. Number one, we've got to watch out for false humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Does that make sense? You spend all your time thinking about yourself, you are still prideful even if you diminish yourself. It's not thinking bad things about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. It's thinking about others more. Humility, false humility, sometimes it just looks like You're looking for more than you ever have. Albert Einstein once said, try not to become a man of success, but try to be a man of value. Be a person that people in the room look to and say, I need what they have. Not somebody of success and try to get the high seat. Be someone who becomes a person of substance. I remember... uh, Drexel Brunson, I think we've had him preach here one time. Drexel Brunson, when I was at a, a wedding, I was at Trey's wedding. Drexel... Well, he carried quite an anointing on him. Like, he just was a person in the room. You just kind of like, you just kept your eyes on him. I don't know. There was just something about him that was attractive and, and anointed. And so I remember when I walked over to him, I was standing in my, uh, my groomsman garb, you know, and everything. And he came by and he, little, little cockeyed smir- you know, smirk, and he grabbed my hand. And he said, Webb Hoggard, I am honored to have you here. I don't. I don't, no man has ever made me feel the way he made me feel in that moment. I was swooned. He swept me off my feet. (laughs) I believed him that he was actually honored to have me there. Now, there was no romantic feelings. Let's not get it twisted, okay? But I felt like he had pulled this whole wedding together because he wanted me to be there. Everybody in your world wants to feel important. They want to feel seen. They want to feel loved. You should picture everybody in your life with a big necklace around their neck to say, make me feel important. That breaks false humility, and it takes real humility. Live with humility that when you're honored, it's more than you expect. A lot of us, when we're ever honored, we're like, yes, I, I, I've been expecting this. I've been waiting for this moment. Live so humble that when you are honored, that you have a personal feeling of like, I don't deserve this. <laughs> That'll make people want to honor you more. False humility, false hospitality, the feeling of, Well, if I do this, they'll owe me back. And the last one is false security. What what distracts or delays you? The kingdom is filled with people who cannot be distracted. So what is he getting at? This is my closing. Personal responsibility. What is on you when it comes to your relationship? Because here's what I'll tell you. Those with good excuses are usually not good at anything else. People who are good at making excuses are usually not good at anything else. And that used to be me. I don't want to think I was a liar, but man, if I couldn't lie myself out of some stuff. Oh, man, I could look so innocent. Oh, oh me? I, I, I misunderstood. I, that's on me. I'm so sorry. If y'all see this face, it's a lie. 
Just kidding. I could, I could excuse myself. Oh, oh you, you don't understand. I, I got some stuff going on in my personal life, and I, I, I was going to try to get here, but I forgot. I didn't forget. And there ain't no more in my personal life than anybody else's. I can give you all the excuses I want. Here's what we have to get to. I would love as a culture of this church to get to the point where we don't look at people and say, oh, you're right, you are going through a lot. You have, don't worry about it. I don't want to be that culture. I want to be a culture that says, be a person of your word, even when you're going through it. Don't tell me you're coming to the party and then not show up. Just tell me you're not coming. If you don't want to come, just say that. I got to get better at that. I'm not coming because I don't want to be there. (laughs) I'd rather be anywhere else. What's the balance in life? If you could live this, you'll feel perfect joy and perfect peace. Nothing is more important than people. Not even the Sabbath. Jesus teaches that. Nothing is more important than people. But no one eclipses the call of God. That's hard. But if you want to bring, if you want to bring some simplicity in your life, people are greater than church. I know that the church is people, but people are more important than anything, any tradition but they're not more important than God. If we could really let that sink in our hearts, I think that would bring us strong clarity and simplicity in life. So what do we do to these things? First of all, humble yourself before God and he will exalt you. If you feel like you're not where you should have been at this point in your life, put your face back down and say, Lord, you'll exalt me when it's my time. The second thing is help those who can't help you back. Help those who can't help you back because that proves you trust God to help you. And last thing is honor God always, all the time, in every circumstance, forever, always. Expect that the good things that come from God is that he is with you. That's the good thing. Now, if there are other blessings, and I'm just telling y'all, last week, y'all blessed us financially. My bank account looks prettier today than this looked at. Thank you. Y'all are a blessing. But I want y'all to know, I don't live my life waiting for the blessings of pastor appreciation. I live my life based on, God, you're gonna give me what I need when I need it. And then when a blessing like that comes, I try to be as wise as I possibly can with it because I don't know when that's gonna go away. How about this? Some of y'all had plans this weekend but that that storm ruined it. So what did you do with the time that you had? Did you take some minutes to be by yourself, to be in your home with your family? Did you take that time to take a nap maybe? Or did you immediately get this extra little bit and you think, okay, I got to get back to work. Let's white knuckle this day. I can get something done. I got an extra day for a change. And whatever you did, that's fine. But here's the thing. Don't live your life expecting these bubbles to take place. Live your life wisely And when the bubbles come, count it a blessing. Do you understand what I'm saying? The gift of God is that he's with me. Other gifts have come with him, but I don't serve God for those gifts. I don't serve this church as the pastor here because of pastor appreciation. If that was the case, I'd take a 10-month break. October's coming back around, right? I serve this church because I love it. I believe in the mission of this church. God has called me here. I'm going to do everything God's called me to do. But when the extra comes, what a blessing it is. And I stand humbled. I speak about it all week about how my people blessed me and honored me. And I'm just overjoyed and thankful. Can you hear what I'm saying? The blessings of God are not the aim. God's the aim. But the blessings come. So I've I've preached for probably over an hour now. But I want you to know your enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal, kill, and destroy. And his major weapon is distraction and discouragement. So today, if you've walked in here and you're very distracted and you're discouraged, 
I want you to take a minute right now and I just want you to say to the Lord, you're all that matters. And I'm gonna try to keep my eyes off of all this other stuff. I don't wanna spend my days managing my possessions, my job, my family, and just forget who you are. I, I wanna see you. Turn your attention to him right now. Turn your attention right now to the Lord. Honor him right now. Give way to his thoughts. Bless him right now. God, help us to see what you'd have us to see. I don't want, I want to be a genuine, authentic son of God. I don't want to be fake. Lord, I live in a fake world. I'm sick of fake. I'm sick of people made up with filters on every picture. I'm sick of having to think through every word. Lord, authentic. I want to be genuine in your presence. So I, I get rid of false humility. Lord, I'm not doing these things so that you'll feel a certain way about me. I just love you. I just love you. Truly, deeply, I love you. Lord, I want to be a person that's not falsely hospitable, only trying to help those who can help me back. I want to be real. I just want to love people like you called me to do. And I don't want to be falsely secure. God, I don't want to rest on my, my calling or my giftings our own results I don't want to rest on my Sunday school attendance or my church attendance or my tithing record I want to be secure in the fact that Jesus died for me and your Holy Spirit has sealed me thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God sermon podcast for more information on our ministry please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.